Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show today. I've got my new friend who I just met for the first time, Matthew Svoboda. Did I say that right? Yep, good. Excellent. Good for me. And um, Matthew, do you prefer Matthew or Matt? You can call me Matt. That's fine. Okay, Matt. Uh, Matt is uh, 37 years old, has three kids that are aged four, six, and eight, with another one on the way in the next couple of months. This is January of 2024 as we're recording this, so um, the new kid may be here by the time this airs. I'm not sure what the release date is going to be on this episode because, like I said, we've got several that are that are in queue right now. Matt lives in Kansas City. Um, is that Kansas City, Missouri? Or Kansas City, Kansas. Kansas City, Missouri. My wife is from Southeast Missouri, over around the the Cape Girardeau area. If you're oh nice between like St. Louis and Cape Girardeau, yeah, um, Louis and, and Matt is a a pilot, seven thirty seven pilot with a previous experience in the military, which is part of the story that he's going to tell today. So I'm not going to reveal too much about that. I'm going to let him handle all that. So Matt, appreciate you being on the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, glad that you're on here. So um, let's jump straight into it and tell me like your backstory because um you know we we we've never spoken before we've never seen each other face to face before we talked a little bit before i hit record but when i'm in that situation with someone that i don't know very well i like to let it unfold organically on camera so okay. um t- tell me about matt uh like i said i'm 37 years old uh been married for coming up on nine years here in uh, may to the um, most amazing person that I've ever met who has really pushed me to um, kind of become the, the man that I am uh, today um, in my personal development, my professional development, and in my development as a father figure. Um, I grew up in a, in a you know broken home, me and my sister. My dad had left when I was about five, maybe six years old. Um, and then I you know, we didn't see him for years and years on end. And then, um, you know, I got into this, you know, young boy, teenager, just kind of running around town and just getting into all sorts of stuff that I shouldn't be getting into, you know, got into trouble, got arrested for this, got into trouble, got arrested for that, you know, got into <clears throat> all sorts of stuff. It uh, eventually led to the point where I was, I was taken out of my mom's home um, and put into a foster home where I was for almost a year now, or a year, a year and a half until I turned 16, uh, up in Nebraska, where at that time, at the age of 16, you were old enough that they moved you out of the system. And if you had nobody to come take you, then you just kind of went on your own. So mm. they, they contacted my dad a couple months before I had turned 16. Um, and then he said he would come and get me and uh, another month went by and another month went by and it was after my, my 16th birthday. I celebrated my 16th birthday in a foster home and, uh, they called him and I said, Hey man, he's got like two weeks and we're going to kick him out on the streets. And he goes, all right, I'll, you know, I'll come get him. So he came and got me and brought me down to Kansas, uh, Salina, Kansas, where I grew up, um, for about a year or so. And then we had to move around because he, you know, would either get us kicked out of where we were living or would lose a job or would go to another place or just, you know, all sorts of stuff, problems on whatever his side was. But we moved out to a really small town of uh, about 300 people uh, in western Kansas. And that, I think, right there was at the time the best thing that could have happened for me. So it was a really small town. Um, it, it just felt really homey and family like, and I met some really good people and, you know, people that really cared for me, um, and, and looked out for me because this whole time, um, my dad and I just did not get along. We clashed continuously every single day. There was, you know, verbal confrontation, physical confrontation, um, up until the point where we got into a physical fight and he threw me through a window. Um, so at that at that point in time, I realized if I had stayed in that home, I was probably 17. I said, if I had stayed in that home, one of us would end up probably killing each other. So right. I had moved out, found some friends to stay with, um, got some help from some people in town who got me. Uh, in touch with an apartment complex that did, you know, kind of like section eight housing type thing, uh, like government housing. So I lived in an apartment 
by myself at 17, um, going through high school, all this other stuff. I joined the military as soon as I could at 18, um, just to kind of, uh, you know, do something. There was, there was nothing. I wasn't doing anything with my life. And this recruiter came up to me one day at school and was like, Hey man, what are you going to do after school? And I said, I don't know, man, I, I don't have any plans. I'm not going to college. I'm, I'm just not interested in that. So I don't know. And he goes, well, if you signed up today, we'll give you $8,000. And I said, mm. wow, that's a lot of money, man. I'm definitely going to do that. Then. So I signed up, um, joined the uh, Kansas Army National Guard. Uh, shortly after that, um, the unit that I had joined was going to deploy to Iraq in 2006. So I um, wanted to go on this deployment. I, I, you know, I thought it'd be cool. It'd be something interesting to go do. <clears throat> so I talked to the school and finished my senior year in about a half a year so I could get out of there so I could go to additional training so I could deploy. Um, went on a deployment uh, with a helicopter unit, fell in love with, you know, flying around in helicopters. It was really cool. I thought it was definitely, definitely something I was very interested in. Um, came back from that deployment in 2008 and moved in with my <clears throat> dad again and his his wife at that time and so again you're it was probably just, what 20 21 at this point yeah yeah i'd yeah. actually turned 21 in iraq i remember my watch going off at you know the time that i was born on the day that i was born going yeah this sucks happy 21st birthday to me man <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i definitely made up for that when i got back so um came back you know moved back in like i said moved back in with my dad and just that you know that animosity again just took over everything that was around us and just it continued and continued um you know to be a verbal physical altercations and stuff like that so i i moved back out found a house um you know and just a lot of other things as i started to mature in my life and started to grow into what i wanted to be i had found a lot of different things that he had done previously and has continued to do that just really kind of showed me the, the person that he was um, found out he'd opened a bunch of bills in my name, a bunch of credit cards in my sister's name, you know, just, just stuff like that. Wow. Um, if we had a relative die, like he was one of the first people there to just, you know, scavenge through the house and, and just see, see if he could get anything out of it. You know, that's, just kind of a leech really on people. Um, so, you know, I started to, I kind of started to find out more and more and more as time went, as I started to get older and, you know, I, I distanced myself farther and farther and farther away. And um, <clears throat> I had this opportunity to come up for me to go to helicopter flight school for the, for the United States military in Kansas. And I, I chose that opportunity and uh, really distanced myself away from him at that time, you know, completely clear across the country for almost two years. And, um, you know, he <laughs> uh, came back into my life by telling me that he was dying from from cancer. Mm. And I was like, oh, man, like, that's, that's pretty rough, you know, like, I, I should probably kind of involve him, I guess, in my life a little bit more. And this was uh, 2000 and. 13 is when he had told me this. So I'd already graduated. I was living on my own in uh, uh, Topeka, Kansas, you know, flying helicopters, all this other stuff. Um, and then I had met my wife in 2014. Um, and we started talking and everything. And then, uh, you know, I, I knew that I was going to marry this woman from the first time I saw her. We met randomly on a Friday night where I was off studying for um, uh, a check ride that I had to take the next day in a helicopter. And then she was off on a Friday night and uh, we met on a dating app and started talking. <laughs> and um, it was maybe a month, month and a half later that we actually met in person. And, you know, I just, I knew that she was going to be the person that I was going to marry. Um, so we had been together for a while. And then this, information started to come out about my dad that he 
didn't have cancer and they had found these documents that he had brought to his local doctor uh, were actually forged and made by somebody else that he had, you know, was working together to, to get all this um, like government help and stuff. So they were, they were sending him, you know, like social security checks and stuff like that. Cause he was, he was, you know, terminal cancer and was going to wow. be dead within the next few years and stuff like that. So, you know, just a lot of stuff started coming out of the woodwork on this. And that was the definitive point where I decided, look, this, this person is not good for me and it's not good to have around my family. Um, and it's, it's not what I want to be around and it's not what I want to base myself on. It's not what I want to grow into be. So the only thing that I would ever say that he actually did good for me was to show me the person that it, I never want to grow into, mm. you know, I, yeah. I never want to be like that, that rage, um, you know, super aggressive, super physical, you know, dominant type of person. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that that would be the only thing that mm. I would say he did good for me. Right. Um, so, then, uh, yeah, that happened. And I. um kept developing myself and kept developing myself and got into a job working uh, for the railroad that was super demanding, super busy, high stress. And I hated it. And it was a real strain um, on my wife and I's relationship. I'd be gone for 14, 16 hours a day at this job. And it was five, six days a week. And they'd call and you, you on your seventh. Day. Did you have your kids yet at this point? Any of them? Yeah. So at this point, this was 2000 um 17 2018 2019 that it was it was it was uh, a big struggle um for us to stay together so we had you know continuously fought we had you know one two-year-old and then another newborn in 2019 and uh, or 2017 and then we had our son in 2019 um and yeah it was it was just a lot and uh, i was not happy in my job i wasn't happy at home and all this other stuff um so we we went to counseling together um really started working on our ourselves you know uh to build our relationship back together um and then you know that's where we came to the census that i don't want to be at this job anymore i would rather go back to go flying and um yeah I, started training again and and uh we'd go to counseling and you know we, we still we still have issues and stuff like that but yeah we're we're doing a lot better and um yeah i worked really hard um i was going to uh, all this training to become a pilot and everything and last year um, i got hired at this place in august and i've been flying 737s for a private charter company and um it's a private charter company. Do you mind saying what the, the on record on, on the recording, what the company is? Yeah. Uh, so the company is the Aero Airways. Uh, they're right in the middle of a buyout getting bought out. Um, but we do a lot of private flying. So we do a lot of bands. Um, we do some NHL hockey teams, MLB baseball teams. We do a lot of the NCAA uh, basketball teams and stuff like that too. I've never heard of that airline. Well, I guess, cause you know, it's a private airline. What's it, what's it yeah. called again? It's a I arrow I A R E O A E R E O yeah oh like arrow okay I see yeah, arrow A E R O yeah I arrow okay that is cool that you that you landed that gig that's um yeah yes yeah, so that's like that's quite the reversal of 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 uh, circumstances to go from from that as a child to where you are now it's and and i commend you for that yeah. that's, there's that's that's no easy task and like it's it's one of those things that's hard on a level that i don't really even want to imagine because it's it's kind of hard for me to comprehend that but um um congratulations and i am sure that you are proud of yourself and and if you're not i am and i encourage you to be proud of yourself that's, that's hey, um, yeah it's pretty pretty impressive stuff um how does all of that stuff that you endured as a child affect the way that you are a dad or your approach to being a dad now with your own kids? Um, so it's, it's definitely 
made it difficult um because i i didn't have a real father figure or a good father figure at any point in my life i mean i was you know late into my 20s by the time i met my wife and and you know met some of her good relatives and stuff like that um her stepdad actually was a a great uh, mentor to me unfortunately we lost him uh in 2021 to covid complications Mm, sorry to hear that um thanks um i would have i would have loved to have had him longer as a mentor and stuff like that he was he was a super nice guy he would he would give you the last penny in his bank account if he if he could help you he would give you the shirt off his he was the definition of give you the shirt off his back you know just a super nice very intelligent man um that i just i really wanted to revolve towards and just learn from him he raised four kids um him and his wife had split up when their kids were young and stuff like that you know and he had some good hobbies and and everything and um i'm really sad and i do i miss him a lot of yeah, greg i could have met him and had him a lot longer in my life yeah it sounds like you came from you know an absolute shit storm as a child and then yeah um like like uh, just listen to your story it's it's really impressive is it fair to say that like your first real positive male role models happened when you joined the military i would probably say that <clears throat> is definitely a big part of what changed my life um those you know you you get into the military and there's, you know, the, they break you down. I mean, they break you down from whatever you were and they mold you into this, you know, lump of clay that they mm-hmm. can mold at will to be what you want, you know, and then you get farther in and then you meet, you know, people that are higher than you that you're like, wow, that's a, that's a really good person. Like I kind of want to hang out around that person. And I kind of want to emulate myself after that person. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there, there are some shit bags in the military, but well, sure. they, they, they get weeded out, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> you run into those, you know, those really good built characters that you just kind of want to make yourself kind of like that same person. So, so, so yeah, I would say that helped me a lot was the military. If it, if it wasn't for that stupid $8,000 check that they <laughs> promised me, I don't know where I'd have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, it sounds like that that coming from that sort of environment as a kid, um, there are a lot of um, generational cycles of, you know, negativity, just, you know, things that yeah. things yeah. that are not desirable to continue on that, that no one would willingly want to pass on to their kids. Like like I right. when I when I hear a story about someone like you're you're describing with your dad. I think that a, a person like that realizes that that the way they are is not a healthy thing and they don't want to pass it on, but they don't know any other way or they don't believe that they're capable of doing it. <laughs> so yeah. um, I'm curious, um, beyond the, you know, throwing your 17-year-old son through a window, physical abuse kind of stuff. What uh, and and of course, just disappearing and not being there for your kid for however long he was gone. Yeah. What um what other cycles like that have you dealt with or broken or overcome? Um, that that you feel like you have pretty well got control over now. Um, definitely still working on um getting control of my anger um you know i'm i'm guessing it's it's a physiological thing that came from you know passed down uh genetically through family genes and everything you know where Mm -hmm. you're just you're kind of easy to snap um uh, also deployments and stuff like that i I think have kind of kind of compounded on top of that um you know and it's it's been it's been years now that uh I've, I've recognized it. My wife's recognized it. Several fa- friends and family members I've had for a long time have recognized it. Um, and I've been, I've been not so much at recognizing like, it's not my problem. Like you're the problem. I'm definitely not the problem. Like you're, you're clearly, you're clearly the problem and I'm not the problem, you know? Yeah. So 
realizing that there is that common denominator and it's me uh, was pretty hard. It's still a pretty hard pill to swallow. Um, but continuously trying to work on that, um, being in control of my own emotions, it is a real big thing. Um, and I kind of see it, you know, I have a son right now, a four-year-old son who's in that emotional development stage mm -hmm. that his very first emotion and instinct is to go to anger and, you know, physical physical violence when you know something happens you know and it's like hey man like let's talk about that like right. let's let's figure this out together because guess what just a couple years ago that was my first instinct and i had no idea how to control it so i had nobody there to you know kind of take my hand and sit me down and be like hey it's okay to get upset you know, it's not okay to punch somebody, but it's okay to be upset, you know? So talking about that stuff is, um, it, it's still, it's still pretty hard for me. I'm still kind of opening up those layers and, and figuring it out for myself. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of one thing that I, that I really want to, I want to break that where you, you know, that, that stereotype of, a man's just got to be tough all the time. Like right. you, you do need to be tough and you do need to be resilient, but you also can show emotion and you can also show love and affection and feelings and stuff like that. Sure. And that's, that's one of the things that like with the guys that I work with or in like some of the, the social media groups that I'm in for dads and stuff like that. That's, that's a recurring theme that so many men have trouble with because um, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm, when I'm 54, so it's at 17 years. So, um, yeah. um, but, but it's still, I think very prevalent in the generation that you grew up in, um, uh, as it was in the generation that I grew up in a whole lot of the, you know, you start out from a baseline of children should be seen and not heard. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which, which if we, if we look at that, it says you don't have a voice and what you have to say doesn't matter is really the underlying yeah. thing that you wind up with from that. And then you put that on top of it for, or, or put on top of that for boys that, you know, uh, be tough, don't cry, all of that. Then, then you wind up with someone who, who wasn't allowed to, to express who they are or how they feel. And, um, it's not okay to express sadness or anything, you know, fear because that's quote unquote weak. And then every, every unpleasant emotion winds up being expressed as a form of anger. Right. Uh, and yeah, then of course that, 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 that very thing. often, want, yeah. And we very often wind up with it in my generation. Um, we would wind up with the whole idea of, you know, a, a, a kid three four years old hits another kid and then the parent will spank the kid as a consequence or as a punishment right and so if you look at that logically what you're saying is i mean like i made a joke about this with with somebody the other day i don't remember if it was on a call or if it was just uh something but it's like we don't hit in this house kind of thing right you know yeah yeah and and so what we're doing there is i'm hitting you to let you know that hitting another person isn't okay to do, which just yeah. doesn't make any sense. And that gets internalized and, and, you know, the whole, I'll give you something to cry about and all of those stereotypes or, or cliches or whatever that go along with it. There, there are a lot of people that actually live that out and believe it. And it sounds like your, yeah. your dad was in that group. So um, bravo to you for, for saying, you know, this stops with me and, and I'm looking at my kids and, and I'm not going to let that continue on. That yeah. is the, that's the hardest wow. work that that can be done. I think is is changing like that. So, um, you know, kids, kids, when you're little, you know, there's a lot of the, you know, people say, you know, do as I say, not as I do, type thing. But mm -hmm. you know, it's it's the monkey see, monkey do. Like Absolutely. you can you can preach it as much as you want. You can say we don't do that and we don't talk to people like that. But when they turn around and see you doing it, they're like, oh, well, it must be okay because he is doing that i know he says that he's not supposed to but he's doing it so you know not not just walking or not just talking the talk but you know walk, walking the actual walk too yeah. so showing them that there's 
boundaries and showing them that that's who you want to be and that's who you want them to be. So to that point, um, you've, you've had experience with extremely negative um, role model, father figure, male figure in your life. And you've had, like you said, with your, with your um, father-in-law, your wife's stepdad, yeah. um, the positive aspect of that. How do you, in your words now, based on the unique experience that you had, um, define what a positive role model is as a father? Oh, man, a positive role model in a father um, is, is uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, my wife's uncle who, uh, they, they live down in, in Texas and I wish, you know, they were here a little bit closer because he would be what I think is a, is a great positive, a positive role model. Um, you know, super supportive of all of his kids, um, you know, is, is always there when they need them, you know, physically, emotionally, you know, f financially, if they needed it to, um, you know, is, is there, he listens, he's a very good listener to it's not just so much someone talking to you all the time and telling you but listening to what you're actually saying mm -hmm. and you know processing that to understand what your actual needs are out of that out of that conversation um you know someone who isn't always going to tell you what to do but can give you their opinion on you know, hey, this is my opinion on what I would do if I was in that situation. Not giving someone the what you should do is blah, 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 because it's, you know, you're not you're not trying to grow the same person as you. You're trying to let that person grow into another good person, yeah. not a not a replica of you, but into their own person, you know. Mm. that's good stuff um we were talking like right before that about uh uh boys don't cry and and everything that goes along with that um yeah there's a there's a lot of um i'm not sure what the right word to call it is there's a lot of i would guess misconceptions is the best best way to describe it about what true good positive energy masculinity really is you know i mean right the, you right. know the, the the idea of toxic masculinity pops up and i'm still i'm still not a hundred percent like uh, codified on 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 that that's that's uh yeah like is it the masculinity that's toxic or is it just the dude's an asshole you know like yeah and, so and, and, and i think that the way that i've that i've best seen that expressed is um the analogy of toxic masculinity is like a cheese burger. It's a burger with cheese. So it's masculinity that is toxic. And I think that, that there's yeah. a whole, there's a whole lot of um, the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater that, that the pendulum swings too far, that, that all masculinity is a bad thing like that, but right. obviously it's not, but I want to hear, you've got a unique perspective. I want to hear your thoughts on that. So, so. Yeah. So I believe there's a, I mean, there is a difference between, masculinity and toxic masculinity so there there needs to be masculinity there needs to be you know differences between men and women they're mm -hmm. they're physically different they're emotionally different they're biologically different and let you know take it back to the hunter-gatherer days you know men are built different men are built heavier you know, heavy duty you know stronger build muscle faster, can run faster because they were the hunters. They would go hunt down the food and bring it back. And they would protect what was hunting their group of people. You know, the, the tigers and the, you know, the other animals that were on the same level as, you know, the food chain back then, you know, we weren't always at the top. Right. We were we were snacks, you know. We were yeah. snacks back. We then. were snacks at one you point. Know, we were snacks at one point. So moving ourselves, you know, into that position, you had to develop into a tougher, stronger, masculine man to protect the ones around you. You know, and is it is it, you know, 
is it people thinking that they're better than the other people you know like i'm a big strong man i'm a strong masculine man and i'm better than you a woman that is where i would say that's toxic masculinity you know because you may be better than them at some things but you're not better than them at other things right because we're we're made different you know they're they're better at growing a baby because guess what you can't grow a baby so they, they are they are you know better than in those situations so I, I do feel like there is that pendulum swing right now where mm-hmm. if you you know are a manly man and you you know kind of go along those lines of that it's they're they're kind of lumping everybody into well that's just toxic masculinity because right. you know men some some men you know think that they're better than other women or other men you know for for however they are um and i think it's you know there's there's bad karma around that right now so you know and i think it's Mm -hmm. people and again with the you know the internet and social media and stuff like that it's easy for them to post a video of a toxic masculine man acting the way that he does and Mm -hmm. being disrespectful and treating people lesser than him you know and we live in a society where stuff like that travels like wildfire but you have somebody that does something good and you know the good the good deed that goes unrecognized you know doesn't get put up on the internet doesn't get a million and a half views and doesn't get posted all over the place so i I think it's a lot of stuff like that yeah, I think that that um, you know you brought up the whole go back in time a few thousand years when we were snacks, which I I love the way you said that. Um, I think if we look at that era of of our history, um, there are certain proclivities that 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 happen there, right? That that like we evolved into those roles, and and yeah, you said I, I said something almost identical on a call the other day it's like it, if you just look at at physicality and and what we what we're suited for if you go back to those times when you know you've got literally people running around with a rock tied to the end of a stick trying to shove it in a woolly mammoth's neck so that everyone could eat yeah and in, in in a snowstorm you know yeah, um, in a snowstorm. yes yeah um it, it it makes sense there, but now we've evolved to the point where we're not snacks anymore, where we are the apex predator. We are at the top yeah. of the food chain and we've, we've pretty well, um, as much as can be done, mastered the environment that we live in, you know, with, yeah. with you know, air conditioners and heaters and transportation and all that sort of stuff. And I think that there's a lot of like primal stuff in our DNA that's been suppressed and, um, those those hardwired genetic gender roles that evolved out of that have been suppressed and and some of that's good and some of that's bad right but yeah. now when there's when when we think about a man's role or a dad's role to um you know there's a lot of things that are involved in that role but but part of that is is and has always been as a parent to protect and provide and both parents have to do that in you know for the children like we have to protect the children we have to provide for the children and the way that we go about that um energetically because i'm going to get woo woo with you from time to time right because i i think in terms of everything is energy and everything's vibration the way that we bring either the masculine or the feminine energy to it has been affected in a way because our society has evolved faster than we can comprehend you know and just i mean even a hundred years ago yeah you know so so how do you how do you see the the channeling of that masculine energy to be useful in a modern context to where we don't have to to ward off the saber-toothed tiger we don't have to you know go out and kill the deer and and all that how do you see that affecting where we are now um so i'm a very uh cyclical thinker everything continues to happen in cycles you know the the earth's rotation it happens in cycles the environment is changing it happens in cycles we can go through the bedrock and see it 
Um, and I think humanity is also cyclical. It's going to, you know, change um, over over years. So one of my one of my uh, one of the sayings that that I like is um, uh, now I can't even think about it is um, good men create easy times. Easy times create weak men weak men create hard times hard times create good men and you know continuously yeah. like that so if you look at the generations that we've had let's say in the last hundred years starting at 1900 to to present time you know there were pretty good times in the early 1900s and then war happened you know the the great war the world war one happened you know and and those great men had to go, you know, take care of this. And then they came back and they were the hard workers that created, you know, that, that fell on the Great Depression and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the Great Depression created, you know, everything else. And then World War II happened. And it's, you know, then we get into the lulls of stuff where things kind of just, you know, they kind of lull down a little bit and it becomes more, you know, you're not on guard and, and, and it just kind of creates this this eased society and then something triggers it and we have to get back up and you know hard men have to defend it again right mm -hmm. um i think you know in in the future um i mean we're we're gonna we're, it's again cyclical we're gonna probably fall on another hard time like that where it's gonna require men of masculinity to go take care of something like that and there's going to be non-masculine men who are you know playing the chess game behind the table using those masculine men to go do their bidding while those non-masculine men you know who can't do it are running it behind mm -hmm. you know um you know I, I think we're seeing a change in kind of different types of masculine men and non-masculine men and and, you, you know, you, you see that with the way people dress and the way people act and the way people, um, you know, gravitate to some social event and gravitate towards, um, you know, environmental outdoor stuff, you know, mm -hmm. the camping, the hiking, the, you know, the shooting, the hunting, you know, or the people that are living in the city and they gravitate more towards, you know, books, libraries, you know, social events and stuff like that. So I, I think we'll see different changes and stuff, but I, I think there's still always going to be just different groups of men and masculinity. Like there's the alphas that led the pack right. and there's the betas that have very important jobs and roles, but they're just not the leaders right. of the pack, you know? So Right. And, I and, think that's think that's what it's going to be continuously. And to that point, I have been increasingly fascinated with the concept of the Sigma male the past couple of years. You know, it's the, he's the one who's like, uh, which I I feel like that that, and I have a limited understanding of it. But um, the Sigma male is the one who's like, if everybody would just shut up, so I can get on with my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm they're, I'm they're not. Either. Uh, I, I think that a lot of the um, self-proclaimed alpha men are just insecure men who are trying to appear more secure. Yeah. Um, I um, I saw a guy on uh, YouTube that w that was making commentary about it. And he was he was actually making commentary about Andrew Tate. And um, I find Andrew Tate very entertaining. And I find Andrew Tate sometimes I'm like. Oh, that makes sense. And sometimes it's just so cringy, you know, and, and I realize, I realize mm -hmm. that that is, that's not who he really is. That is an amplified persona that he's putting it's out there up, yeah. that is deliberately polarizing so that it doesn't matter if you say something good or something bad about me, you're still talking about me, that kind of thing. Yep. Right. So yeah. I, I totally get that. That's where he's coming from. But this guy was talking about Tate and he says, uh, he says, I'm paraphrasing this, but, um, but, it doesn't matter how many fights you've been in, in the ring where there's referees to take care of everything. And it doesn't matter how big and strong you look or how big and strong you appear or how loud you are. Um, 
in his experience, and this guy, um, I forget what his what his uh, YouTube channel name is, but he's a he's a rancher, like a cowboy, like yeah. yeah. Um, and and like all of his videos, he's he's sitting back smoking a cigar. He's got this big bushy beard, and he's like it 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 was like a a real life character that a uh, real life version of a character that like someone like Sam Elliott would play, right? Right, right. And um, and he was talking about Tate, and he said um. I do know this from experience. The loudest man in the room is never the da- the most dangerous man in the room. And, mm-hmm. and he said, when I see Tate, I see someone that's insecure. But then to his credit, there's another video later on where he said, I saw some more Tate stuff and it made sense. So he's a more complex person than what he's putting out there, which is the, what he's putting out there. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but this same guy was talking about, I, I saw a video of him last night. He was talking about horses and he was talking about if you go at a horse trying to get it to, to train it to do what you want it to do and you do it too aggressively, they will become more aggressive. And he said, it's just like kids. If you if you meet your kids with aggression, they will become aggressive, which right. I agree with completely. But um, I like that was a bit of a tangent. But um, yeah, it's 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 a, a matter of of how that energy is applied. I, I think masculine and feminine at, are best determined as or best defined as energy and they're yeah and they're they're not really opposite energies they're just different expressions of the same kind of energy right yeah so so um having said everything that we said that way about you know masculinity and all that um and coming from the the background that you come from and dealing with the things that you've dealt with and are continuing to deal with and are going to deal with in the future how yeah. does all of that affect your relationship with your kids or your your um, approach to being a dad, especially since you have boys and girls? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, definitely take I take it a lot slower than, you know, what I think maybe normal people would. I, I have to slow down and process stuff and just be like, all right, how do I want to handle this situation? Because my first instinct, again, the stuff that I'm dealing with is, well, that's it. Throwing up hands and we're just going to, you know, we're just going to show this as angry aggression and I'm going to be the the more dominant force and I'm going to shut this down, you know, and that's, that's not the way that you want to teach somebody how to control their anger and control their you know understanding of themselves and to grow into that person that can understand their own emotions so still developing that myself i do slow down quite a bit and have to take some deep breaths and be like okay how are we going to de-escalate this situation here without raising my voice raising a fist you know, hurting both sides of the argument, you know, it's, you're usually pulling, you know, two kittens apart here, like that are fighting with each other. So it's like, how do I pull these two kittens apart without making one feel like it's getting punished more than the other one, you know? Um, And working through that still, and, and is there a right answer? Is there a wrong answer? Is there a perfect father? No. There's not. It's always going to be someone who's working on developing themselves. You know, 40, I'm 37, almost 40. You said you're 50, uh, young 50s. There's people that are 60 years old still working on how to develop their relationship with their children who are 30 and 40 years old. Right. So is there a perfect answer for everything? No. Is there a perfect answer for yourself? Yes. Not what I say is going to be the perfect answer and work in your situation or vice versa. Um, you know, I think it's just all of us coming together and talking and giving our experience of, you know, what we're doing or what's working or what seems to not be working or just standing there on, you know, the edge going, Hey guys, I just need some help, man. I, I need a friend just to talk me down right now because I don't know what to do, you know, uh, having girls, it's, you know, we, we have our two girls who are six and eight and they're definitely different than raising a boy who is four and, you know, is 
is just has no fear right now and it's just it's terrifying because you're full of fear for them and you're like don't do that you're gonna get hurt or you know don't blah 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 because of this and this and this and they go through a different emotional range and um in their in their young age when they're growing and when they're developing you know they like i said he instead of my oldest daughter who would go straight to kind of sadness or kind of being upset and would run off and cry. Um, my son goes straight to, Oh yeah. Well, guess what? I'm going to break your TV and smashes your TV screen. And you're like, cool, bro. <laughs> like, Let's not do that. Okay. I can't replacing televisions. Yeah. Um, you know, so finding that way to kind of connect with each one of them on a different level of like how to, how to let her wind down and then gradually talk through that and how to, you know, talk with him about stuff uh, and, you know, going through the steps and processes and stuff like that. Each kid's different, each parent's different. So you, you kind of go through different ranges with each one of them. And it's, again, it's still something that I'm struggling with as not having, you know, a father figure and um, my sister and I being split up at a younger age and she went and lived with my dad and lived with my mom and back and forth and stuff like that. So not being able to see the interactions between your parents with each, with either, you know, child, um, it, it's kind of hard you know, to, to figure out what you're going to do. Cause you have no baseline. You're just kind of out here free falling. So. Um, yeah. To, to, to that point, um, <clears throat> do you have for yourself or like, like, like what is your, your fundamental set of principles for being a father? Um, you know, I want to, like I, I want them to like know that they can confide in me like they can trust in me that I'm not gonna be a um you know if you do something wrong that you you can come talk to me like I'm not gonna be a disciplinary parent when it comes to something you know like is there gonna be times you're gonna get disciplined yes but if it's something, we need to talk about, you know, like, th then let's talk about it and let's work this stuff out together because I don't have all the answers and I know you don't have all the answers. And so we can, we can do this stuff together. So, you know, I want to be fair, um, honest and open with, with each one of them, you know, and, and just, I don't know, man, try to be the best that I'm trying to be. It's, you know, it's, again, it's really hard when like, I've never really had something super, super tangible to just kind of work with and work off of with, with a father figure. Well, that's, that's most of us, right? I mean, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, that's because we're not, uh, we're not really, uh, there's no instruction man, right? You know, I'm, I'm right. Yeah. I'm fond of saying that. And I think that, you know, I've said this many, many times that really as dads, all we have to draw on is our own upbringing, which gets imprinted in us. And we can either repeat that or we can decide not to. And then the other, the other aspect is whatever society deems is this stereotypical example of a father. And if we look at, at how fathers are portrayed, uh, we have, the hard fisted disciplinarian kind of guy, right? That the guy that takes no yeah. shit from his kids and, and you know, the, the, Oh my God, don't tell my dad, he's going to kill me guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, unfortunately yeah. that's, there's a lot of guys in our day and age that are, that are, that subscribe to that. And then we have the, you know, the absent provider, like my job is to go out and earn a living and put a roof over your head and food in your mouth. And beyond that, yeah. I'm, I, I, I don't have to have a connection with you, you know, like yeah. uh like Denzel Washington's character in uh, Fences. I don't know if you ever saw that or not, but uh, I don't think I have. It's a it's a movie that's adapted from a play. But this teen boy comes up to Denzel, and Denzel's the dad, and he said the the teen asks him, "Why didn't you ever like me?" 
and which is heart wrenching to think about it, right? To to think right. like I imagine my son at five asking, I, I it's unimaginable for him to 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 even think for a second that I don't like him or to right. feel like I don't like him. But that's the dialogue in the movie, right? And um, Denzel defends his position essentially by saying, I don't have to like you. I have a responsibility for you. I fed you, took care of you, all that sort of stuff. I don't have right. to like you. That's not right. my job to like you. My job is to keep you alive, you know, and, and, yeah. and kind of like, kind of like prepare you for the harshness of the world by being harsh to you. And and, and I'm like, yeah. wouldn't, doesn't it make more sense to, to prepare a child for the harshness of the world by teaching them how to be compassionate and, understand yeah. that the harshness yeah, of the world is happening because people are wounded and, yeah. and I can help people kind of stuff. So there's that. And then of course there's the, the whole um, Peter Griffin, Homer Simpson, just bumbling idiot doofus. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, are you old enough to remember Herman Munster? Did you ever watch the Munsters? Yeah. yeah, the yeah. Monsters. Herman, Herman was cool, but he was just, <laughs> just dumb, you know? And um, food, so, man. Yeah. so when that's our baseline that we have to draw from, um, and very few of us are ever encouraged to think outside that and to think, um, I get to decide who, who I want to be and how I want to show up as a dad. And that well, once you, once you realize that, yeah. um, that becomes like the hugest responsibility ever. Right. You know, to, to, to think, how can I, how can I make this better for them than it was for me? Cause like I grew up in a, in a, a pretty good environment. You know, we, I wasn't abused. My parents were married until they both died. It was, you know, everybody had, has their issues in their family and all that. But, but, you know, I, I never thought my dad didn't like me. I never thought that he wouldn't be there to help me and guide me. And like the, anytime any trouble came up, he was always the first person I could go to and talk to. And I'm really grateful yeah. for that. The stuff that, that I, that, that got handed off to me was like stuff around, um, uh, like a, a really strong blue collar work ethic where you sell your time for money and, yeah. and, and then money is scarce and we have to really hang on to it because someone's going to come and steal it kind of stuff, you know, or, <laughs> you know, any of that kind of, st and so it, it was, it was before I was a father, I realized that and that, okay, I'm going to continue to work my ass off and be broke if I don't address my beliefs around that and my mindset around that. And so that's what I did. Yeah. But then, you know, having a kid, it, everything that, and, and I'm sure this is um, even more so for someone like yourself coming from the situation stream when the kid shows up now it's like this is even more important now because this isn't just me getting through my life right now this is all the future generations to come yeah which is which is a big burden you know um <clears throat> so um, I, I think that's a big i think that's hard for some people um is to overcome that feeling of like I mean, I am the world to me, right? Like the world revolved around me as a young boy. I am this guy. I am, everything's important. Everything that I do revolves around me. And then having an offspring and realizing like the world doesn't revolve around you anymore. It revolves around you taking care of this individual and growing them to be a good patron in society, not a detriment to society, not someone who's going to end up in jail and on you know, government assistance and all this other stuff. But now you have to step out of the limelight and start putting that person into the limelight of growing that person into a better human being than what mm -hmm. you are, you know? And that's, that's kind of, that's, that's exactly what I want. Like, I want my kids to grow up and be better than I was, whatever it is. I just, I want you to grow up and be better than me. <clears throat> and that's what I want them to have when they grow up and be parents like, man, I want you to grow up and have a better life than I did. And I want you to grow up and have a better life than I did. You know, mm -hmm. not the, 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 like you, you said before the generational, you know, well, that's the way it was when I was a kid. And that's the way it was when my dad was a kid. And that's the way my grandpa used to beat him when he was a kid. So mm -hmm. that's the way it's going to go falling down the tree, you know? And it's like, <clears throat> Maybe that apple fell from that tree, but that apple rolled off into this open pasture and we're going to grow a new apple tree. Okay. Whole new world. We're going <laughs> to go over here and we're going to start over. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, what, uh, what lessons has this whole 
journey that you've described on taught you about, you know, resilience and personal growth and, and, um, being a better man so that your kids can have a better life. Yeah. So I would definitely say like resilience is key. Like you are not going to be perfect in it. You're not going to be good at it either. Like when it, when it first starts and it first happens, like you're not going to be good at it. It's something you've never done before. It's like jumping into a pool at 20 years old and you've never been swimming before in your life. You're not going to be great at it. You're going to fail. You're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to, you know, swim to the, you're going to have to make it to the edge and hold on to something, you know, until you can figure it out. If it's someone that, you know, some, something, a book, a, you know, a TV show, a podcast, a, you know, a mentor that you kind of want, you, you need to do it because we don't have to do it alone, you know? And that's, I think people kind of get into that mindset of like, I can't ask for help. You know, men don't ask for help. Mm-hmm. Men do not ask for help. I don't need help. I'll figure it out. It may take me 27 trips to the stupid hardware store, but <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna walk across the street and ask Jim, who's a licensed plumber, that I need help, you know, to, <laughs> yeah. to plumb in this stupid water heater or whatever it is. Right, right. You know? So kind of getting over that hump of, you know, there's resources out there. And guess what? We're in the best era for resources. If you don't want to go talk to someone because it's embarrassing, cool, man. Google it. If you don't want to, you know, if you don't want to read a book, there's audio books, there's videos out there. So just people getting out there and learning you know, of, of what works for other people and what might work for them and, and stuff like that. So. <clears throat> Good stuff. So currently uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, but before we shift gears, what, what advice would you offer to other men who are navigating similar challenges or have had a similar um, backstory as you like, like how, what advice would you give them? So my advice would be you're never stuck where you think you are right so whatever situation that you are in or whatever situation you think was given to you or handed to you or you know you may find yourself in at that moment you're you're never stuck there you're never stuck in that position you can always find a way out you can always find help You can always find, you know, a a different branch. You, you, You can always make it out of where you are. Like if I would have been, if I would have stayed where I was in up in Nebraska, I probably would have wound up in a ditch somewhere pumped full of, you know, some trailer park trash chemicals, you know, right. Um, you know, and then, and then finding good people to, revolve yourself around like find someone that's better than you and learn from that person you know find someone that's better than that person and learn from that person ask that person that you are mentoring who's their mentor you know because 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 that's what it's all about it's it's creating a chain of of people that you can rely on to make yourself stronger right like A single link of a chain is strong, but two links of a chain is even better. And when you put three links on that chain, you start to make chain mill, you know, and chain mill is stronger than just, than just a single link. So creating something, you know, that, that is going to help you maybe push you out of your comfort zone, you know, maybe make you feel uncomfortable, maybe make you realize that what you're doing isn't the greatest or there is something better out there you know yeah. so to to shift gears then um although it's not shifting gears that much <laughs> as a dad um yeah. what is the biggest challenge that you face just you know across the board whatever it might be um my biggest challenge is um definitely showing my emotions um, you know, when I, when I get 
mad at something or get upset at something um, instead of showing that emotion in anger, you know, showing them like, oh man, I got, I got scared. Dad was, I was scared that you were going to get hurt, you know, like showing them that I'm also vulnerable to those kinds of, those kinds of emotions have been kind of hard. Um, you know, my son stuck a fork in a light socket as we, we bought this old home, um, this old 1880s farmhouse that we're, we're renovating ourselves. So, you know, he stuck a fork in a light socket and it got him, it shocked him, you know, Mm. and man, yep. That's why you don't do that. That, you know, you could have killed yourself. You could have been dead, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, I wasn't mad. I was scared. Like that terrified me that it could have hurt him even worse than it did, you know, or, or killed him, you know? So trying to work, trying to work on stuff like that is, is definitely the hardest part. Um, the, the job that I'm in, um, I'm gone for a few days at a time and stuff like that. So having that, um, separation from my kids that are so young and the little people that I love more than anything in the world. Um, that's also pretty hard. Um, thank God we live in this day of technology where I'm just a phone call away or a FaceTime you right. know, or a video screen away. So that's, that's definitely, um, it made it easier. So trying to keep that physical and emotional connection with your kids while you're gone even if it's a two, three day trip, um, you know, is, is, is pretty hard too. So we kind of get wrapped up in our own little worlds and we forget that there's, you know, currently there's three other little worlds that are around me, right? you know, that I need to be part of too, soon to be four. So, yeah. And you said the one that's on the way is a girl too. Yeah. It's going to be another little girl. <laughs> so my, my poor son, but, uh, <laughs> It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, that given the, um, the level of awareness of a level of self-awareness that you're bringing to it as a dad, you're going to be able to help him throughout his entire life to use growing up with three sisters as, as an opportunity to understand how to, how to communicate and understand and relate with females. Yeah. Rather than, you know, I, I, I know plenty of guys that grew up in, you know, a group of three or four boys and they, they're clueless how to, yeah. how to interact with women. So I think that, uh, yeah, I guess I never really thought about that. I have always grown up with sisters. I have two half sisters, a full blooded sister, and then at one time had two stepsisters and stuff like that. So, you know, that's probably why I actually do get along better yeah. with a lot of women than I do men. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> That yeah, that sense. doesn't make sense. Well, um, I just noticed how long we've been going. This is another one of those conversations where I'm like, okay, we're probably like 20 minutes into this, right? And I looked yeah. over at the clock yeah, and right? I'm like, nope, we're 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 <laughs> at least at an hour. I'm not sure what time we yeah. started, but we're we're in the yeah. hour range. So okay. uh what I want to do now is uh if it's cool with you, is kind of shift gears a little bit again and um just go rapid fire on some questions. Okay. I'll yeah. just throw out questions and they're they're uh some of them are kind of fun. Some of them are kind of pointless. I've got a list of of several, and I'll just grab whatever I feel like okay. grabbing and throwing at you. Okay. Um, start with something a little more lighthearted. What's a useless talent that you have? Oh man, uh, useless talent that I have is my wife and I joke about it. I have used up all of my luck on finding parking spaces and not winning the lottery. So that's my useless talent. Like I could find the best parking spot at walmart or target or sam's or the gas station wherever we go it's the best parking spot but man i could not win the lottery to save my life <laughs> <laughs> that's funny um what is your favorite holiday thanksgiving is my favorite holiday it um it brings everybody together there's not that you know that christmas present exchange gift type thing you know I, I like christmas too i just i like thanksgiving it's more of a a come together bring the family together holiday so yeah. and you know food so yeah to that point um if you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life what would it be oh man i've never had a bad pizza so mm-hmm. probably pizza that's good um the flip side of that what is like the most disgusting thing in the world that you would absolutely refuse to eat 
Peas. Peas, like green peas? Peas, like green peas. I <laughs> think they are the epitome of evil. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and I guess to the point of Thanksgiving, what is a cherished family tradition that you um, have initiated that you hope that your children, and it could be something that, that you know, from your growing, from growing up, it could be something you decided as a family, this is what we're going to do, starting with, with me as a dad, yeah. that you hope continues on infinitely into the future generations, thousands yeah. of years from now. So we actually have two different Thanksgivings. So we have our, we call it stakes giving. Mm. So the weekend before we do, you know, steaks, ribeyes or, or whatever. And then we make our own favorite foods, green bean casserole, macaroni and cheese, corn, you know, casserole, all the stuff that we really love. And it's just our tiny little family, you know, and we sit around and we just, you know, have a good time with each other. And then the following week and on Thanksgiving, we go to the large family uh, gathering. So I, I kind of hope our kids will always do that. You know, that smaller, bring your unit, your small unit family together as a whole. So stakes giving, I, I hope that's what's that, going to be a thing for family. That really is cool. And it also gives you an opportunity to, to bond with the family over a meal that is not comprised solely of tan and beige foods. Yes. Which are delicious, but, but you know, <laughs> love tan and beige foods. But... They're great. But uh, yeah. I think there's a reason. I have this one. awesome, uh, spicy horseradish cranberry sauce that is just, it's to die for. And it's, you know, the only time of year that she makes it because it takes like six, seven hours to make. So. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what is a funny or heartwarming dad moment that you've experienced or maybe something funny that one or more of your kids have, have done that where you just literally fell to the floor laughing? Man. Um, or the lights you up and you're like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so each one of them has just got their own little personalities, you know, where um I, I I I'm a funny guy I'm a fun guy I like to have humor and, and joking and stuff like that so um man I don't know there's there's just there's so many different you know like different times and stuff like that that you're just like oh man I, I just love it so I, I do like it seeing you know they'll be in a different room of the house all three of them kind of like huddled together like playing a game together or you know reading a book together and stuff like that and that right there really that really warms my heart like man I I love seeing you guys be together and and love one another actually love one another so yeah that is really that's right cool. like we're doing a good job right there <laughs> um so what's the most valuable piece of advice that you've ever received and it can be about any topic or any you know anything like that um, the most valuable piece of information is, you know, probably that, that, um, it's, it's what I said, um, you're never stuck where you think you are. So I had actually heard that from one of my drill instructors in basic training, um, cause you have all different walks of life that are coming together. You know, we have people from inner city of Birmingham, Alabama, and, you know, me out in the middle of nowhere, you know, Farmville, Kansas, and, you know, then other people from Los Angeles and all this other stuff. And, you know, he just said that he's like, you're, you're never stuck where you think you are. There's, there's always somewhere for you to go and advance your life. So. Very cool. Um, and then the, last one for the rapid fire is what's a personal belief or a personal mantra something like that that you are determined to pass on to your kids um man personal mantra that are something i could pass on right um you know just just be a good person just be a kind person there's so much in the world right now of just hate and just vile and viciousness that you could be kind to one person every day just 
change their life. You know, you never know. Just saying hi to somebody or, you know, a ho- opening a door for someone or small little acts of kindness, you know, just be kind to people. I love it. I love it. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. Um, okay. Matthew, I appreciate you being on with me. Um, yeah, you. We, uh, w- when we initially started talking, I asked you about if you had an email list or anything like that, because I have a lot of entrepreneurs on here. You, um, if anybody wants to, and, and you don't, you said, but if anyone yeah, wants yeah. to uh-huh. connect with you or talk further ab- about any of this stuff, if they're, you know, if, if they hear your story and they're like, I, that guy gets me, I need to talk to yeah. him. Um, if, uh, w- is there a way that they could get in touch with you if they wanted to do that? Or would you rather just um, keep it private? Yeah. So I think I sent you my, my, um, my TikTok uh, yeah. profile. So it's not like I'm not on there doing all these, you know, TikTok dance videos and stuff like that. It's it's mainly just places that I've gone with work <laughs> and flying through clouds and seeing earth and stuff like that. But yeah, if you want to reach out to me on that, um, you know, we could, we can talk and exchange, exchange information on there and, and go from there if anybody was interested cool. so i will i'll make sure i'm actually making a note right now to include tiktok link yeah in the show notes that we do i mean well i i um this has been a great conversation i feel like i've made a new yeah, friend thanks. and um yeah, I'm, I'm really, really glad that you reached out and that we're you know we had this conversation and i'm sure that someone's going to listen to this and get a lot out of it um, I know yeah, I, have, I hope so. so I appreciate it and yeah. I'm going to sign off for now. Thanks for paying attention, everybody. And we'll see All you right, on the next thanks. episode.